Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of I Dang Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfamensa. And if this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, I welcome you and I hope that you return for future episodes, especially after this one, which I know you'll enjoy. And for those who are returning listeners and viewers of this podcast, as always, I thank you for the support. I welcome you back and I hope that today's episode is one that you find informative, enlightening, and as always insightful. Before we get to the main event, for those who are on YouTube, please make sure you hit that red subscribe button for future episodes of the podcast podcast and notifications for those who would like to make a donation to help us continue to build this platform you can make a donation at cash app using the handle money sign id talk for ed and then for those who are on venmo you can use the handle at Kwame SM. That's K W A M E S M. And of course, to catch past episodes of the podcast, you can certainly check out our YouTube channel, but you can also go to our main website at Identity Talk or educators.com and oh yeah by the way if you're listening from apple Podcasts, spotify or any of those other platforms make sure you subscribe there as well thank you so ladies and gentlemen as we continue down this a lock rabbit hole if you will i got another fantastic guest someone who i've been trying to get on here for some time but i'm just glad that our schedule were able to align to do this episode and have this conversation i consider this gentleman to be one of the busiest people in international education. He is at every conference, every webinar, every session. He is everywhere. He is about the work. And and he is somebody who I've just admired from afar. And I'm just so happy that I have an opportunity to learn more about his story, to learn more about his travels throughout different countries in his international school career. And he's just somebody who's really about humanity. He's really about inclusion and what that looks like in international schools. So we're going to get into all of that. But without further ado, I want to bring on my good friend, uh, Mr. Joel Leobon to the podcast to talk about his story, to talk about his journey through the different countries and all the great work he's currently doing. So let's bring Joe on so we can start this conversation. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi, Kwame. You are so kind and gracious and generous and loving in your introduction. Thank you. It's a joy and an honor to be sharing the space with you, but also it's really a joy and honor to be in community with you with the work that we do in international school. And like what you said, it's a a rabbit hole in the ALOC community because following and listening to your podcast and listening to the stories of from Gary and Rama, and I know Shatana is going to come out as well anytime soon. It might have come out already, as well as Angeline. It's just so powerful that you have brought in the stories of our community Community. And stories have the power to heal, stories of the power to restore, and also stories of the power to create a, a radical dream, like what ALOC has been um, talking about. How does it look like? How does equity inclusion look like in international schools? And what might be some of those equity, inclusion, diversity outcomes that are not yet there, that our community and the communities that we are in coalition with are continuously building together? Thank you for this opportunity. I know our time has always been sort of crisscrossing, but it's it's also powerful to be in the same space with you in Hanoi. And I loved our walk together around the lake in Hanoi. And that was just so powerful. You, Kevin, and myself, great conversation and great food as well yeah yeah it was just awesome for all of us to finally be in one physical space in the flesh usually we're like this in front of screens which is also beautiful as well but it's always better when you're in person with the people you're in community with i appreciate those sentiments which i also share on my end but yeah let's get into this conversation because you have a fascinating story so for those who aren't familiar with the international school ecosystem typically when you go to majority of international schools worldwide You see mostly teachers from the U.S., you see teachers from different parts of Europe, maybe some coming from Latin America, but predominantly it's United States and Europe, right? You coming from the Philippines into this space, which makes you in many ways an anomaly. (laughs) So 
I'm interested in learning from you. Like, how did you catch that bug? What inspired you to even want to do this work that we do as educators? Yeah, it is an anomaly, like like what you said. But actually, there are so many Filipino educators that are across the different international schools. As a matter of fact, there's already a Filipino affinity space hosted by ALA, facilitated by Madeline Heidi, and there's a growing number of community members who are joining in, connecting, and supporting. But like what you said. I started out almost close to 20 years ago in international school back home in the Philippines. And that was my first international school where I started out at Cebu. And being there as a local higher teacher, learning the culture, the identities, the stories, as well as the systems and structures that are the foundation of international education. But also what inspired me to become a teacher is also really way before that. In the Philippines, I grew up in a smaller city, small town, church community. And so, yeah, I started out my joy and being with children, teaching in a summer school for, for catechism, where a smaller city or a smaller town, and I would be organizing communities to, to support us in the work that we do with children in the summer, in the summer months of, in May. So I, yeah, I started out my joy of being in the classroom or in schools when I started teaching in a catechism back in the Philippines. And, you know, it's the summer months of, in May, which, which is basically the summer months of, of the Philippines. That's when, yeah, I organize communities to, to be with children, to teach them Catholic teachings and yeah, all of that. And also organizing different parts of the church and, and community and youth organization. So that's where I started. And then I enrolled in a teacher training program back home. And from then on, I started teaching in private school for boys to start with for my first two years. And my pedagogy has not been aligned with that particular school. And so I moved on into international education where it really really values diverse identities of students, but also different ways and pedagogies of how children learn. And that really brought me so much joy and experience and developing expertise and experience in international education. And then from then on, moved on after six or eight years in Cebu, moved to the International of Beijing, and then where I stayed for five years and then moved to Brussels and Kuala Lumpur. And yeah, that has been the journey in international education. And like what you said, it is an anomaly because back then I considered myself a one of the very few Filipino educators. And I thought about us being very few, but actually there were so many already back then who are in different international schools. It's just that we never really connected because we are in silos. And the beautiful thing about what's happening right now with our work in community building is that we're bringing together people who used to be in different siloed locations. And now we are connecting, collaborating, building our community, and also telling our own stories and what it means to be in this place and space. So what does it mean to be diverse identities working in predominantly white-centered institutions? And what are those challenges? What are those successes? And what are the systems and structures and practices that are healing? But at the same time, we also need to talk about what are those that are harmful to racialize identities and identities in the margin in international education. So you were mentioning that you started in your home country, the Philippines, and you were there for quite a while. So I'm wondering what specific specifically drew you to want to make the move abroad? Where Was there a particular moment or was it just an accumulation of moments along the way that just drove you to say, okay, in order for me to really grow and spread my wings, I need to be in a different location. I need to have a change of scenery. And I think both, one being having met a number of educators and leaders in international education and having heard about their stories about different areas national schools, you are drawn into the possibilities and potential of living in a different country, learning different pedagogy and structures and systems that will potentially enrich yourself and the way you teach. And yeah, and so I was fortunate to be supported by a wonderful leader who has been a mentor and a sponsor who really nurtured me and my leadership skills and competencies and really supported me to become the best that I can be and also sponsored me to say, hey, it's time for you to move on to a different international school and learn new things and new new opportunities and new possibilities. And, and I'm so deeply grateful for that. And at the same time, I really enjoyed my time being at home as well because it's close to family. There's also a certain level of comfort being in our own community. And on the other hand, 
there's also beauty and joy around living in a different country and learning new things and learning to cook for the first time. It's back home. It was like, yeah, we'll eat out. We'll go for it. We have restaurants in different places and in shops and all. But really, when you live in your own, you get to enjoy and learn new things for you to survive and, and thrive. And I've been to a few Asian countries, but I've never been to the Philippines. But I have friends who have been to different parts, whether it's Cebu or Manila and, and other parts of the country. I'm wondering, in terms of how Philippinex people view education as a profession. I don't know if that has the same type of respect as other professions, because I know growing up, if you grow up in Ghana, for instance, and you tell your parents you want to be a teacher or an educator, they look at you shamefully and they're like, why don't you just become a doctor? Why don't you just become a, an engineer or do something in the high sciences arena? So I'm wondering if there's a similar sentiment in the Philippines. Yeah, it's, it's both. And I think one thing is that education is deeply valued in, in the Philippines, primarily because it is, as you know, cliche as it may sound, but a great equalizer, you know, and it really supports communities and people advance through life. And actually, I grew up in, in a smaller city or a town. Back then, it was a town, now it's a city where all my elementary school teachers were technically my, at some point, first degree or second degree relative. And so we'd always see them in dinners and we'd always see them in different family get together. I grew up from elementary school, from first grade to sixth grade, where my parents are so engaged and involved in my own education, not just because they also want to, but also they are by design, it's just a consequence of it. My, my teachers are so connected to my family. And so yes, there is a lot of pride and joy to be a teacher in the Philippines and how that is valued, how that is supported structurally, economically, and politically is a different story. But then when it comes to thinking about, there's a lot of deep respect that we have with educators in the community because the, the Philippine teachers are not only teachers of the classroom, but they're also community educators. They are brought in sometimes unpaid, a lot of unpaid labor who will serve in, in elections and among many other ways that they can con contribute to the community. But there is such beauty, pride, and joy that we see in educators in the Philippines. And so, yeah, they are considered to be a lot unsung heroes in, in our country. Yeah. And you mentioned that as a kid, a lot of your teachers were folks who were within your own family. So it was really close knit. Let's dive into that for a little bit. Tell me what Joel was like as a kid. Because I know when we go through our schooling, there's always ups and downs as far as what we experience, as far as us trying to figure out who we are and who we want to be, because there's so many things happen around us. I'm curious to know in your schooling, what were some of the struggles and experiences that you had in terms of figuring out who you were or who you wanted to be? Yeah, no, that is a deeply beautiful and also personal question. I love sharing that part of, of my identity primarily because that's really in support of us as educators now, how can we design an equitable and inclusive space for queer students in our communities? And me growing up as a queer child in a heteronormative society and it's some, in so many different levels, there are experiences of bullying. There's the experiences of microaggression and microinvalidation. You know, we didn't have terms like that before, but that is what it was back then. But also, yeah, it is your, your experiences of school is very fragmented because you reveal yourself to the people you trust and that you also hide yourself from the people you don't trust or you feel that you are not accepted and tolerated and included and so and that includes this family as well being able to come to terms with that and also have let in my family into my identity has been one of the most incredible gifts that I have given myself to to that um, you know being able to live my full, true, authentic self is such a liberating experience. And I only came out of my mom when I was 29, although they probably had a punch for sure. But that kind of like level of acceptance, the clarity around it is so, so important and so joyful to experience that I think that is my hope and wish for, for many parents with queer children and queer identities, for them to really with openness to, to the full authentic selves so that their children are going to grow up loving and living themselves in their most authentic self. And that is the best gift we can give our children. Yeah. And I know that's a lot. And as a cis heteronormative black male, 
I can't relate to the experiences that you had growing up. I don't know what it's like, but I'm curious to know, because you said 29 when you finally came out, right? That's correct. Yeah. What finally got you to finally do that? Because I'm sure there were times along the way where you were thinking about it and then you said, mm -hmm. uh probably not the right time. I want to say it, but mm, yeah. I don't even receive it. <laughs> and I'm yeah. only asking this because there are so many people who have gone through the same situation as you have. I've had mm -hmm. students in my classrooms who are queer and they would come out to me before they came out to their own parents. So this is why mm -hmm. I'm so intrigued by this question because I know it's different for everybody. I think it would be helpful if you were to share, if you don't mind, of course. Yeah, you know, and you know, like what I mentioned earlier today, queer identities, racialized identities, identities of the margin, we are always looking for either levels of safety and levels of, of threats. And that kind of, Zaretta Hammond mentioned that in her book, Culture Responsive Teaching of the Brain, where, you know, we've got that amygdala hijack, the moment we don't feel safe, learning does yeah. not take place. And so I had educators and teachers before who I considered as people who I'd feel, oh, they are, these people are safe, would include me, who would I feel safe to to let them into who I am. And when I think about that, there were no, there were limited shedding and shaming of who you are. And then there were also places and spaces in the community where you would be filtering and sort of putting a cover of yourself because you don't want to reveal who you are, who you truly are, you know, in that, in, in a community. And so I think having that, what prompted that is that, you know, you just, I don't know if there's a specific moment, but I think it's also about the continuous understanding of who you are your strengths, your capabilities, and that level of self-empowerment. It's a coming together of your understanding of your own identity, as well as learning from the people around you. You are empowered by either educators or friends who continue to affirm your identity. I think those are important in a journey and a trajectory of a person's coming out in a community. Yeah, it's definitely a lot to unpack. As somebody who has gone through uh, therapy and does life coaching, coaching i've come to realize that there are a lot of traumas that you internalize you don't realize how they're manifesting in the different parts of your adult life until a loved one points it out whether it be your child whether it be uh, your partner whether it be a friend of yours you know you're just out here living and then they tell you mm, there's something off here you might want to process that a little bit to figure out what's the source of that trauma what's causing you to behave or have some of these tendencies and mannerisms that you display sometimes therapy is the only way for you to get those answers i know that was the case for me when it came to just my own family life and trying to understand the trauma that i dealt with surrounding my own father and just the verbal and emotional abuse that i dealt with but it took me up until like almost 40 years to finally get to a point where i confronted it yeah and I wow got, and i got a wife and two kids so it's a lot. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, Kwame. And also, thank you for sharing that. And I think it is. Healing is a journey. Like, yes. I think that is what we have come to, to understand, you know? And I think that is where the obligation of educators to really design for spaces that are identity affirming for all students in our communities. I think that is really what we've been emphasizing in different communities, that the work on culture responsive and culture sustaining pedagogy and teaching is beyond the understanding of of, you know, heroes and food flag and festival. And, you know, that's really what we wanted to hone in and insist upon that move away from just that. I mean, those are important, but really it's about identifying, building that relationship, getting to know the identities of our students beyond their nationality and age and all of the other labels and markers that are easy and accessible for us to be able to filter and organize our class list, but really to get to know our students at an individual level because when we get to know them and we want to be responsive to who they are, we are informed by that street data and that we can design a classroom that are affirming and validating and sustaining for them so that many of our students or all of our students don't have to experience the same levels of harm that many of us have experienced growing up. And I think that is the work of our generation of educators now is that to build that radical dream consistently and continuously in our community. So this season, I Dance Talk for Educators Live will be including ad spots for businesses, products, 
and events that are adding significant value to their communities. And here's the catch. You don't have to be an educator or an education-based business to be a part of this. We're looking for people who are just doing great work in the community, and we want to use our platform as a way to amplify their work. So if you are an entrepreneur or you know of an entrepreneur who is doing just that, bring them in our direction. Have them reach out to us. If they want to learn more about their ad spots and how they can get themselves promoted on this platform, they can contact myself, Kwame, at Kwame at IdanityTalkForEducators.com. I'll say it one more time. It is Kwame at IdanityTalkForEducators.com. Hope to hear from you. And let's keep on amplifying our work and building each other up. And this is a perfect segue because I do want to talk a little bit about uh, DIJ work for a second because it's so central to what we believe in and how we align uh, as educators. I asked uh, Shewatanga this question when I had her on, and it's one that I've had deep thoughts about. So we know that in this international school ecosystem, we live a very transient lifestyle. I mean, you notice you live it. Like you're in one country for maybe two, three years. On average, you're moving on to another country, do the same thing, another country. And as all this turnover is happening, we're still trying to put these systems in place to ensure that our schools are inclusive and diverse and, and equitable, right? And our spaces where our students can belong. But I always wonder if we have this transient nature about international schools, how does that impact our ability to sustain these systems that are meant to be built for inclusive spaces because sometimes people like you and I, we champion these causes, we champion these beliefs, but then the minute we leave, we leave with all those beliefs and then the school is back to phase one because it's not ingrained in the, the school culture. Yeah, no, that's a lot. And I want to unpack that a little bit more primarily. Yeah. I'm just really thinking back that, you know, we need to be very reflective about foundation and history and and current systems and structures and practices of international education. And this makes me think about the quote that I have from Isabel Wilkerson in her book, Cast, oh, wow. that talks about marginalized identities. I just watched heart. Origin, my wife. I just oh, watched that Origin. Is, yeah, that is, that's oh. incredible, deeply moving movie. I watched it in New York with, with a couple of friends from ISS and we were there and we were just like sort of sitting there afterwards a little bit, sort of processing it. And I think I needed some space after that. But what I wanted to say was that she said marginalized identities have a hard enough time moving in a world built for others. And I think if we want to truly become more inclusive in our national school, I wonder if the on-ramp or entry point for us is about just diversifying, bringing in as much diversity, or is it designing for equity, which is really looking into the foundations, the practices, the structures, the systems that are lasting and sustainable? What does it mean to, I think my questions and wonder is that how does it look like? What are the indicators of an equity-centered right. international school? And that's why I'm so appreciative of the work of the Leadership Academy. And we've been using and sharing some of the works around the equity continuum because it provided clear indicators of what equity can look like in governance, what equity can look like in leadership, what equity can look like in curriculum and assessment, all the way to physical architecture of a school, including community and belonging. And so sometimes we tend to be going back into, let's just Diversify, And, you know, there is power to that because when you also have diverse identities in the community, that means it's, that we're also building that coalition of people with dominant identities and also diverse identities coming together, building something that's equitable and inclusive. However, we need to also make sure that the design of the system are inclusive and equitable so that the diverse identities can lead, thrive, and succeed without shedding or shaming any parts of who we are. And I think that is the most critical entry point for me. There's there's a lot of great work from the works of like Paul Gorski, for instance, who talks about, you know, rethinking the role of culture in thinking about educational equity. So that's a powerful starting article or research that I usually offer to the participants of 
the principal's training center where I also lead a course leading for the IJB International Schools and also the works of Dr. Yolanda Sila Ruiz around the archaeology of the self because if you don't she she has that one in her own racial literacy development that we cannot interrupt systems of inequity if we do not have the radical love the radical reflection the critical reflection critical love critical history about our own systems and that's why when I when I shape and sharpen some of the facilitation and courses that I that I facilitate and lead it used to be self to systems that's meaning right. to say it was like you need to do a lot of deep work first around yourself before you can even transform systems but to me what I'm reflecting and in changing my thinking is that there's a continuous work on self and identity in order for us to be able to design equitable inclusive systems and then the systems that we have designed will also inform and shape and sharpen who we are as individuals as leaders as educators in our community as we continue down this path i came across an article by dr janice gassam masari and she's a di consultant based in the states and it was a forbes article where she poses a question a poll question about the future of DEI. So of course, when we say DEI, we're going to include all the different iterations and <laughs> and the alterations there. DEI, DEIJ, Jedi, ID, I, all those, right? So I'm going to put up the results of this poll where she included about 500 different educators. So this is the actual article from Forbes for those who want to check that out. But then she also has the results, which I'm going to pull up right here. So I'll even zoom in a little bit. So the question was, what is the future of DEI in America? So this is based on American educators. And according to the results, it said that 40% of participants believe that there's less funding and investments in DEI work across the board. 25% said that there's less focus on race and racism. 16% believe that things will just remain the same in terms of DEI work. And then 19%, almost a fifth of the participants believe that DEI is pretty much dead. That is no longer relevant. And I found this fascinating because when we look at how DEI came into existence, a lot of it stemmed from the death of George Floyd. People saw that and they said, okay, we're going to go ahead and start implementing DEIJ statements and we're going to have DEIJ offices. We're going to create DEI positions for different individuals. So there was a lot of momentum around 2020 at that time. And then now we're in 2024 and depending on who you ask, there's some believe that stagnant. Some say that it's become more performative. Some are saying that there needs to be some type of refreshing of the work in order for it to keep moving forward. So I just want to provide that context and see how we can fit that into international schools. Because as you know, being a director of DIJ with uh, ISS, shout out to ISS and the work that you all do, because you are leading it in many ways. I'm wondering, what do you believe personally is the current state of DEIJ in international schools, just based on the work you've done in the space? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that, Kwame. And also thank you to Dr. Janice Gassanasari for, for posting it out and really sharing some of the realities and context in different places. And what I know is from our own context within our national schools and the organizations and the schools that we, we support, we partner with, we collaborate. And that's a place, an area that I can speak. I'm living in a place of hope and that we, when we are committed to the work on sustaining the identities of our students and developing and designing equitable and inclusive spaces, we can name this work in so many different directions. There's value to the language, right, of equity and inclusion, but there are so many different outcomes and actions that can be designed that is still responsive to, to the goals of equity and inclusion. My experience and my understanding and the stories that are that we have across different international schools is that, yes, there's no more emphasis around the idea of whether we are posting our, our statement or not, but now it's about how does it look like in our own community? How does equity and inclusion look like in the classroom? And that's what we've always been emphasizing in, in our cohort for Learning to Action. It's about the idea that however you design that, how responsive is that to the identities 
in your community? What are the outcomes that you are trying to develop? And like what Lily Zhang had mentioned in their book, DI Deconstructed, and also most recently in their book club that's hosted by Margaret Park through ISS and ALOG, it's really about how are we measuring those outcomes so that we know that we're making a difference not only for ourselves, but more importantly, like what they mentioned, it's for others. What is the outcome of that for communities? And so going back to that perception that we have is that there are many different schools and organizations that are doing deep track work in different communities. I'm really shout out to the different organizations when, you know, when you attend a conference and you look around and just the level of the exponential increase of diverse identities, black and brown and queer folks who are facilitators and keynote. I mean, I know that's only one of the outcomes. That's one of the enablers, but that's not yet the outcome, right? But that to me is an example as well of an outcome of a goal where we want to diversify the people who are on stage learning and leading our learning. I really want to shout out those organizations that are doing that deep work who are really asking questions about, hey, who else might we need to listen to and learn from? And there are different schools as well who are now not obsessed with, with the equity statement, but then they're also really now becoming obsessed with how does it look like in the classroom for our black and brown folks, for our queer folks in our community and anyone else in the margin in our community. That to me are the international schools that are doing, doing deep track works because they're really focusing on designing for equity in order for diverse identities to thrive and succeed in our educational spaces. As well, those are the schools who are thinking not only about the constraints of what else can't we do, but also they're thinking about within our power, privilege, and influence, what can we do to make a difference in the lives of our students? I think I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful and I'm joyful to be collaborating and learning from those international schools and organizations. Yeah. I'm so happy you mentioned that because it is truly a space where there is joy. While there are struggles and while there are different issues that we tackle that take away a lot of our energy, the joy emanates from the fact that there are people who are by your side doing that same work. And you can gain strength from those people around you within the community. And that's what's beautiful about what we do. And one thing that you do that I don't know why I'm now learning about this. I feel like I should know, but you have a very artistic spirit about you. You writing poems, you do portraits, and you convey your messaging in so many artistic ways that I just find fascinating. And we don't have all the time in the world to get into all the different pieces, but I'm interested in knowing what role has art played in your ability to convey that radical dream as you continue to navigate your own journey in figuring out who you are, who you want to be. Well, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Kwame. I, I think art to me can tell a story of things that we cannot articulate with our own words. And through the works that I do at home, from either painting or just scribbling or drawing, or it tells a story of my own personal healing without having to articulate it in words. Because sometimes healing and trauma and joy and liberation are so nuanced that sometimes there are no words for it. Or maybe others may have words for it, but then for me, it comes out in my paintings, the, one, the things that I do at home. The funny thing about it, because sometimes my friends would be like, well, the moment I start painting, they were like, Joel, is everything okay? <laughs> because to me, so it's like, oh, I, I joke around with this one. It's like, I know we should all be advocates for mental health and we should have people that we're talking to or therapists and people who can support us because that is the right thing to do. We go for our physical health with medical practitioners. We should do the same thing with our mental health. But then I joke around with the whole idea and I don't know if it should be a joke, but it's like, oh, it's cheaper than therapy because to me in itself, it's a healing experience. Whenever I am with my paint on the floor, I actually don't use easel. Yeah, not with paint brushes, but sometimes I use my hands with them. So a lot of them are very much broad strokes and big paintings because it involves my broad stroke. That to me is healing in itself. I love painting and I love art. I don't produce it for anything else, but I, I produce and I write things for myself because first and foremost, it is art should be a gift we need to give ourselves. In many ways, your art is your space of refuge. That's what allows it. you to have a break from all this work, which we know is emotionally mentally and physically taxing to our bodies. So I get
get it. We need to find a space and time to be, to fill our cups as well, you know, and I think that is important to the work that we do, not only in the works in DEIJ, but also as human beings doing a lot of different things in different places, especially in these exceptional times. All right. So we're approaching the hour. So I want to start landing this beautiful conversation. So I have a couple more questions. First question is, what is one lesson you have learned in your international education journey thus far? Thank you for that question. To me, the one of the greatest lessons that I think it comes down to the alignment of purpose, people in practice, understanding our why in international education, in our classroom, in our teaching, the work that we do collectively. And then the second one is about people that, and the work that we do in education cannot be done by one person. It has to be done in community with others. And the last one is about practice. Like what are the actions that we are doing in support of humanizing the people that we serve? And then also in alignment with the purpose that we have in schools. And I think that alignment of purpose, people, and practice practice resonates with me as one of the greatest lessons that I've learned in not only in our national education, but in, in serving our students in general. Right. Excellent. And then finally, how do you continue to stay true to the educator in you? Yeah. When I think about that question, it makes me think about what are the things that we do that truly impact the students we serve? And that's one. And the other one is about continuously building capacity and competencies for ourselves and for others. And so whatever it is that come our way, you know, whether emergent technology, inequities, racism, injustice, culture responsive teaching, whatever goals that we have that is in support of student learning, what are we doing that we are building that collective competencies and capacity so that we can move from awareness and reflection to becoming self-directed, to becoming self-transforming individuals for ourselves and for our, for the communities we serve. Awesome. And Joe, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I know we've been trying to do this for weeks, so I'm so glad that we finally were able to get together and make this conversation happen. I know the audience appreciates your vulnerability and you just sharing your story throughout this hour. I want to give you an opportunity to let folks know how they can connect with you beyond this interview. So whether it be uh, social media, you could also use this time to talk a little bit about ISS and the work you're doing there, because I know there's a lot of great things that are on the horizon there. So yeah, I'll thanks, thanks Kwame. This is a powerful space that you are creating and carving for a community. And I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity to be in your identity talk, staying true to the teacher in you. And I love that because all of us who work in education, whether you are a head of school, a non-teaching staff, a teaching staff, whoever you are, within the proximity of students are educators and teachers. So thank you. When it comes to the work that we do at ISS, I would like to invite so many of you, all educators and non-teaching staff and leaders in the community to join us at the International School Services Learning to Action Institute for International Educators and Leaders. We have one that is on foundation. It's a cohort for educators and leaders across the, throughout the whole year. And then we also have the advanced program, which is really for those who attended the foundation can move into the next cohort for advance. And the goal of that particular cohort, it's really to build leadership capacity and competencies to design for caring, critical, and courageous change making within our own community. And it is facilitated by so many of our community members at ALOC. Shout out to, to many of them who are there leading the work with us at ISS. And they are, you know, it's according to when we designed this one, it's really focusing on self and systems. And then and the second part is in called designing for culture responsive education. And the third one is about how do we design for equity, inclusion, and anti-racism in our community. So it's a carefully designed cohort where we meet, we come together, learning from our facilitators, but also we go back to our own communities, taking action with our own communities in that kind of iterative process. I'm leading it alongside, you know, the, the wonderful friends, Margaret Park and Dana Watts and Liz Duffy and John Burns and Mike and Molly Fay and everyone else at ISS who's been so supportive. And this is in collaboration with our community members and leaders at ALOC. And so Kevin Simpson has been a great partner, thinking partner around the design of this, of this work too. And so it is such a wonderful space, not only to be there to learn, but also for the many leaders who are doing this work in different communities, they're also there in the spirit of horizontal engagement and horizontal teaching, which means the teachers who are there from different schools and, and leaders from different communities would also come in and say, 
here's what works in our community. Here are the outcomes that we have. Go try out this particular process so that you can also lead it in your own place. And so I love that kind of reciprocal engagement, but also reciprocal teaching so that we become autonomous, agentic in the work that we do in designing for equity and inclusion. And so thank you for allowing me to invite. Aside from that, there's also not only learning to action that's offered at ISS, there's also teacher recruitment, where we really would like to invite as many diverse identities in our communities to, to sign up for ISS, because we would love to really make sure that teachers in our community reflect the many diverse identities that we have in our own school, as well as our range of professional learning, apart from the learning to action, that's also facilitated by more than 50% BIPOC identities. That's really like shout out to Dana for really designing that intentionally, as well as more than 230 different languages on offer. And so that particular goal at ISS is really to, to, to support in making it accessible and equitable for different schools across the world. And so please do join us in our learning space at ISS. All right. You heard it from the man himself. Make sure you all go to the ISS website, which I will include in the episode notes. So you all don't worry about that. Joel, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. And we might have to do this again because I think there were some things that we definitely left in the parking lot. But yeah. we'll find some time to unpack some of those other issues and questions. I'm happy that you had a chance to talk with me today and the audience. And I wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kwame. You take care of yourself as well. And thank you for this opportunity. All right. Thank you, my friend. Bye, everybody. Thank All you. Right. Thanks for Bye. All right, people. This is another episode of I Dance Talk for Educators Live coming to an end. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I certainly did. So many gems that were dropped throughout this hour. And I hope that you all take some time to rewind, fast forward, take notes on anything that Joel talked about today. But uh, until next time, I wish you all good morning. Good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. We're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody.